paint by number fight scenes, step by step. That's what we're going to talk about today. This is the Fight Right Podcast. First off, you know I always start this way. Guys, check out my blog, Fight Right, F-I-G-H-T-W-R-I-T-E.net, as well as my book, Fight Right, How to Write Believable Fight Scenes. And this that we're talking about today is not in my book. But if there's a book too, hmm, maybe, eh, this should definitely be in it. I am asked pretty often for kind of how to write a fight scene step-by-step guide. And I've always said, you can't do a step-by-step guide for writing fight scenes. Everybody's writing voice and storyline are different. And so it's hard to do a one-size-fits-all sort of situation. And I certainly didn't want writers to go by a formula because that's basically copying. And copying doesn't lead to creativity, right? Well, wrong. I have definitely changed my mind on this. If you remember nothing else from this podcast, remember this. You are not, you are under no obligation to remain who you once were, meaning you can change your mind at any time. And I have changed my mind because according to a study in Japan, they found that copying absolutely can lead to creativity. They had a large group of artists that were given three days to paint an original piece. On the second day, half of the artists were given a famous painting to copy. So they took a break from their original work and they went and copied another painting. I think it was The Scream by Munch. That's all they did for that second day. On the third day, they came back to their original piece and they were found to be more creative than those artists who focused solely on their own creation for three full days. The thinking is that copying allowed the artist's brains to paint without any pressure. There was no pressure to create something new. And without that pressure, their brains focused on the choices made by the artist of the painting copied. And it allowed them to focus on their own technique. And consciously or subconsciously, the artist compared the choices of the target artist artist that they were painting to the choices that they themselves made as they paint. And they began to consider possibilities that they hadn't before. In essence, copying gave their brain a chance to think in a new way, which led to completely new ideas. It also allows uh, the brain to consider the work it is emulating on a deeper level and kind of reverse engineer it. In other words, see why it works. Kurt Vonnegut did this, uh, did this very thing in a master's level thesis he wrote while the, at the University of Chicago. And, you know, he said that of all the things he's ever written, that was probably his greatest gift to humanity. And that was this paper that I'm going to refer to at the University of Chicago. He looked at popular fairy tales and he mapped out the protagonist's ups and downs. What he found was that time and time again, not all, not all, but many of the fairy tales he looked at had a distinct pattern or shape, and it was something like this. Okay, protagonist is doing okay. Protagonist is not okay. Protagonist is okay again. You can actually go on YouTube and watch him give this speech, and his word is, what he says is, man's okay, man's not okay, man's okay again. People love that story. And it's true. If you look at Cinderella, um, it opens up and Cinderella's okay. Now, yes, and sh- she is and she isn't. Yes, yeah, she is um, mistreated by her stepmother and her stepsisters. But for the most part, Cinderella is a happy... P- you know what? Happiness is a place. Joy is a state of being. And even when Cinderella wasn't necessarily happy, she had joy. So she's in an okay place. Well, the next thing you know, she, every time I say that, I think next thing you know, old, Je- old Jed's a millionaire. The kinfolk said, Jed, move away from there. California's the place you want to be. So he loaded up the truck and he moved to Beverly Hills, that is, swimming pools, movie stars. If you don't know what the heck I'm talking about, then you are probably under the age of 45. Bless your heart. Anyway, so Cinderella, you know, she 
has a fairy godmother. She goes to the ball. So she's in a wonderful place. So she's okay. And then she's mega okay. And then she loses that glass slipper. And so she is no longer okay. Oh, but look, it's all right. The prince finds her. And so she is okay again. By the way, glass slipper? How comfortable can that possibly be? How do you even begin to dance in a glass slipper? But I digress. If you listen to my podcast, you know that 50% of it is digression, but I'm getting back on track. Okay, maybe copying a fight scene format isn't such a bad thing. Um, I have always said that fighting is like writing, and I have certainly emulated my coaches. I had one coach that called me Mimic because it was a uh, it was Muay Thai. And I copied him to a T. Even little idiosyncrasies, idiosyncrasies he did that didn't have to do with fighting. I had started copying those things. And you know what? It made me a better fighter. Absolutely, I want to copy my coach. They're the ones on the mat who know what they're doing. So therefore, fellow fight writers, this post is all about a formula you can follow. Now, this is just a suggestion that you can follow to get your own style going. Just like in the artists, when they copied the painting, it, it wasn't something that they had to redo completely, absolutely, perfectly, like Edvard Munch did when he created the Scream many, many years ago. You do not have to copy what I'm saying step by step by step, but consider, consider doing your next fight scene this way and see if it kind of takes some of the pressure off you and allows you to be a little bit more creative. Now, again, it's a concept in progress. I'm refining it, but I talked about it on an interview not long ago, and they really liked it. So I also think I wrote a blog post on this for Writer's Digest, and so far, so good. So hopefully you will find this useful. Also, um, this does relate to verbal altercations as well. Verbal fights, in verbal fights, the pain uh, and injury is emotional. So when People ask me about fight scenes, which are, you know, about writing a fight scene. I have to say, well, you know, is it a physical fight scene? Is there people going to be throwing hands or is it verbal? Both of those, in my opinion, fighting does not have to be physical. It is a clash of wills where injury is intended. And that injury can be emotional or it can be physical. Both are fights. Okay. The guide we are going to follow that I suggest to you, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, is based on a sanctioned fight. If you've ever watched a sanctioned fight, it's boxing, MMA, um, Olympics were not too long ago. If you watch boxing in the Olympics, you will see that there are um, several distinct stages. First off, you have the walkout. You have the face-off, the throwdown. And the takeaway. Here we go. The walkout. Okay, so the fighter is standing behind the doors to the arena. The fighter is safe. All is calm. The doors open and she is just flooded with external stimuli. Sights, sounds, smells, visceral sensation. The walkway to the ring, or square, depending on what they're fighting in, is a downward slope. So it's pulling the fighter toward the bout. The tension in the room builds the closer the fighter gets to the ring. Okay. Have your character start out in a place of safety. Then allow the story to push them toward the fight. Add in sensory details to pull your reader into the scene. Give them a front row seat to that altercation. As your character moves closer to the fight, Build that tension. And you can do this even if the character has no idea that a fight will take place. Maybe in the midst of the calm, you can add in a sensory detail that gives warning. You know, a sound, a shadow that they see out of the corner of their eye, you know, depending on the point of view. You can also give the character a sudden, inexplicable, uneasy feeling, which, by the way, is a scientifically accurate thing. Look, our conscious minds, our brain is taking in everything around us. However, so as to not overwhelm us, it doesn't make us aware of everything. Okay? Whether you, okay, this is, I'm probably going to mess you up for the rest of the day, but I want you to know this. You can probably see your, your nose and your peripheral vision. Did I just mess you up? 
Now that's all you're going to see all day, isn't it? The fact is we do see it all the time, but we don't notice it because our conscious brain doesn't bring attention to us. Our conscious minds might overlook overlook certain stimuli, but the non-conscious mind does not. I don't mean unconscious. Unconscious, you're out. Non-conscious is the part of your mind that is taking everything in, but not telling you know, the rest of your mind about it. That non-conscious mind, it does not miss much. You can choose to, by the way, safety tip. This is why when you are, and I teach this in self-defense, if you are ever in a situation and you suddenly just don't feel right, you feel suddenly anxious, uneasy, unsafe, and there's really no concrete thing you can put your finger on, so what? Get out. Leave that situation because you have to to trust that your non-conscious mind is picking up things it's not telling your conscious mind about. That is very common. Listen to your gut, literally. Okay, so you build, you can build the tension by hinting to or outright showing the reader what lies ahead. That is the walkout. Okay, after the fighter walks out, there is a face-off. A face-off is when fighters stand in the middle of the fighting arena uh, face-to-face. This is the moment that it all just gets real, real fast. It is no longer just a circled date on a calendar that a fighter has been training for. A face-off is like a baptism into the reality that you are about to battle another human being who wants the same thing you do and they will hurt you to get it. During a face-off, you are completely aware of what is at stake. Often, for professional fights, the organizers have the fighters face off publicly days before they meet in the ring. And there's one purpose for this, to build the tension. The more tension there is between fighters, the more folks seem to invest in the outcome, not only emotionally, but in ticket sales. Okay. The face off is the moment your character faces the reality of the attack and their brain switches into defensive mode. They are in that face off moment. And it may not be immediate. You know, sometimes the mind needs a hot minute to make sense of what's happening and determine what's at stake or why it needs to fight. That why is of the utmost importance. Okay, let me repeat that. Nothing has a greater impact on a fight than why it is happening. The face-off moment gives the reader or, you know, the character truly understands the why of why they're about to throw down. Nothing has a greater impact on it. And it's the first thing I talk about in my uh, Writer's Digest University class. If you want to take writing classes all along, head over to Writer's Digest University. They have tons of classes going. And there are, I don't know, one or two, a couple classes that are recorded that you can watch anytime you want. And mine is one of those. So go to Writer's Digest University, put in Carla Hoke, C A R L A. H-O-C-H, or you can put in fight right, two different words, F-I-G-H-T-W-R-I-T-E, and the class will come up. Why is the most important aspect of what you should consider before you write, write a fight scene? Because it tells people what's at stake, and, the, and what is at stake will determine the speed, the style, and the intensity of the combat. That face-off moment for your character also gives the opportunity to create tension. If the stakes are high, tension will be inherent. I mean, we don't usually write, um, quote, in that moment, she knew she would die or whatever. No biggie, end quote. No, that's not how it is. We make our character, when they realize their life is at stake, they will rage against the dying of that light. And hopefully our readers will be invested enough in the threatened character that just a a wet fingered anxiety will creep over their skin at the thought of that character's demise. Boy, that was a picture, wasn't it? Wet fingered anxiety. I got the creepies now. Hey, gold star for me. Okay, we have the walk out, the face off. Now we have the throw down. Throwdown is when fighters clash, when the fist meets with sweaty flesh with just a smack and the red welts, you know, become 
blood-filled knots and the eyes just kind of swell up into big fat aubergine eggs and crimson boy I'm on a roll here crimson you know just mingled crimson mingled sweat just flows down making map of a map of pain on the skin fluid fills contusions until faces just become amorphous mounds of human pulp this is the moment when your character is actually fighting it is also when the fight scenes tend to just go off the rails the number one i issue i see in fight scenes is simply writing too much i go into this a little more in depth on my blog and i um i use a reporter's what is the name oh my gosh the name of the blog post you know what would be awesome for the podcast if i would prepare that would be awesome go to my blog fightright.net look uh and put um, muhammad ali in the little spy glass and this will probably come up i hope i think now i'm gonna have to go back and make that one of the keywords Okay, I use a reporter's uh, recount of the Thrilla in Manila as an example. Um, It's a historic fight between uh, Muhammad Ali and Joe Frazier. Guys, about 500 punches were thrown in that fight. That is a shocking number of fights. By the way, I don't remember the number of rounds in that fight, but Frazier's um, coach finally threw in the towel because he was afraid for Frazier's safety. And there were a lot more rounds. Why cannot, again, preparation. Why did I not prepare? There were a ton more rounds in the Thrilla in Manila. And after that, that is when they cut down the number of boxing rounds to what we have today. However, the reporter did not tell about every single one of those more than 500 punches. They own, the reporter only documented a, um, a small fraction of those. Why? Because readers don't care about every single punch. They want to know what happened as the result of them. For this fight scene guide, only include three major moves in the fight. Choose the ones that have the greatest impact on the fight, pun intended. After each move, back away from the action a bit. Go into the heads of the fighters. Maybe add in a little dialogue. Yeah, I know that's not always realistic. Okay. I mean, authentic. I understand that. I just did a podcast on uh, go for believability rather than authenticity. Okay. But just trust me. Action movies do it all the time. They throw dialogue into fight scenes and viewers are okay with it. Just keep it to a minimum. Unless the pacing is really slow and the fighters are making a point to talk while threatening one another i.e. the princess bride in the fight between Inigo and Wesley, uh, when Wesley is the Dread Pirate Roberts. Okay, when it comes to choosing which fight moves to highlight, take a cue from comic books and graphic novels. These works detail lengthy fight scenes and just a few panels. A, A panel is a little one section of drawing. So you may turn to a page and there's three panels. There's three individual sections of illustration. And then you may have one page that is one single illustration. So that's one panel. The artist chooses the moves that have the greatest impact on the scene. Every other punch happens in the head of the reader. Something else comic book, uh, comic books and graphic novels are great at is adding in those sensory details when one character hits another you'll have a call out balloon noting sounds you'll have uh, like biff you know bang pal you'll have illustrations of flying sweat and blood and the faces of the characters tell far more about the punch than the drawing of the fist okay writers you don't have to write a punch to show a punch the description I gave about fighters clashing in the ring, it, it gave you imagery of fighting and only included one punch. Just that thing I said earlier, please don't make me repeat it because I don't know if I can. But remember when I was talking about blood mingled sweat and aubergine eyes? So I only really remember, remember including one punch in that. You know what? You're probably going to rewind it and I think and may have mentioned 200 punches, but I'm pretty sure it's just one. By the way, do you remember where I put the punch in that little snippet? Probably not. Well, you remember all the little imagery things that I said, heck, I don't remember putting a punch in there, but I remember the imagery. Sensory details of a fight are what the reader will remember. Maya Angelou, I quote Maya Angelou on this 
I may quote it in every episode, and when I, if I do, that's not near enough. My Angelou once said that people will forget what you say, but they won't forget how you make them feel. And I think that pertains greatly to writing and fight scenes especially. Give the reader something they can relate to, which is pain. We all understand injury and pain. There is a cicada. I don't know if you can hear it. Right outside my office window. It's the sound, sound, song of the South. I love it. Okay, so we have the walkout, the face-off, we have the throwdown, and now we're going to have the takeaway. After a fight, win or lose, a fighter has to decide what comes next. Are they going to keep fighting? Or are they going to leave the sport? If they keep fighting, they will need to improve, not only to win if they lost, but to keep winning if they won. After your character is in an altercation, there should be some type of evolution, a change that comes about as a result of that fight. If the character doesn't change in some way, you risk losing your reader. If you do the work to get uh, a reader invested in a character, the character's suffering has to have some meaning. That meaning may be to show the tenacity of the character, um, to steal their resolve, or it may be to crush the character from the inside out, forcing them, you know, to retreat into the safety of isolation. So, there you have it. One more time. There are four distinct parts for this little fight scene guide. Number one, walk out. This is when the character goes from safety to peril. The tension gradually increases. Sensory elements bring the reader re- ringside. Then you have the face-off. The character realizes they're in danger, stakes of the fight are made known, and tension is at a zenith. I love that word, zenith. That's a, that's a good one. Number three, you have the throwdown. This is when the fight ensues. Highlight only three movements. Back away from the action after each one and highlight the sensory details in the fight. Last, the takeaway. These are... This is the changes that result in the character because of the clash. So if you are struggling to get your fight scene written, try this little template out. It will take the burden off of you and you'll be surprised how much creativity you have. Now, do you always have to have action, move away, action, move away, action, move away? No, you may find that you do a couple actions. And then you kind of back out. By the way, that's exactly how it is in a stand-up fight. You get in close, you deliver your combo, boom, you get out. Meaning you back away to a safe distance. So again, yet another time when fighting and writing are very, very similar. So give it a shot. Also, don't quit practicing. How many professional fighters do you know that just, you know, before the fight, they're asked, you know, have you prepared for this fight? Uh, you know, I, I've fought before. It, it can't be too different. Heck no. They're practicing. And when you practice, you make mistakes. That's when you're supposed to make mistakes. So you can see what you're doing wrong and get yourself on a better path. So don't think, you know, you've written a fight scene and you read through it and you're like, oh, this just isn't good. Perfect. Perfect. That's what you want. Go from there. Keep going. And if you think the fight scene isn't good, circle what, does anybody write anything anymore? Am I the only one that still kind of writes stuff? Anyway, circle, highlight, whatever. You know, what it is that you don't like. And think, okay, what is it I don't like about it? Or find a book with fight scenes you absolutely love. Try to write your fight scene as that writer would in their book. Not because you want to live the rest of your life writing like somebody else. It's because everybody needs a coach. And before you learn to do things your own way, you emulate your coach. So I hope this really helps you. Don't forget to check out my book, Fight Right, How to Write Believable Fight Scenes with Writer's Digest slash Penguin Random House, and my blog, Fight Right, F-I-G-H-T-W-R-I-T-E dot net. If you misspell it and it's Fight Right, R-I-G-H-T, don't worry, you'll still get there. Also, find me on the Instagram um, if it's up and running. It was out for a little while there. Ooh, I want to know the details of that so bad. I want to know the details of that so bad. But look at uh, look me up, uh, hashtag fight right, one word, or at 
Carla, C-A-R-L-A dot C dot Hoke, H-O-C-H. I'm thinking about changing my name to Fight Right Carla. If you think I should, send me a message. Anytime you have a fight question, uh, anything about your fight scene, guys, send me an email through the contact form on my blog. Reach out to me in a post on Instagram. And by the way, almost weekly, I give little uh, tips or I highlight different posts um, from my blog on Instagram. And I also do uh, answer questions on IGTV. So definitely head over to Instagram and give that a look. And there you have it. Until the next round at the Fight Right Podcast, get blood on your pages. Oh, one more thing. If you do head over to Writer's Digest University and want to take one of my classes, which I will be getting more in the library soon. Okay, let's all just take a breath. I'll be getting more in there soon. Also, if you're listening to this podcast, I'm going to tell you a secret that I haven't told anybody. Um, Well, a few people know, but I haven't made it public. Um, I am going to be fighting in the uh, International Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu Federation's World Championships in the no-gi division. That's the uh, slippery division with kind of rash guards and compression stuff. I will be competing this Friday. So at some point, hopefully, I'll let... You know what? Check Instagram or Facebook. I'm not on Facebook that much, but, you know, Facebook too. Uh, Carla, C-A-R-L-A, Hoke, H-O-C-H. I think actually on Facebook, I'm Carla Cook, C-O-O-K, Hoke, H-O-C-H. And um, maybe I'll update you on how I did. I don't really post that sort of thing very much. But I'll tell you what, if I fell down and busted my face, that I would post. But, you know, winning stuff, eh, I don't post that that much. Anywho, if you take a class, fight, F-I-G-H-T, 10, 1, 0, the number 10, you'll get $10 off. And that's it. I promise. That's really it. Until the next round of the Fight Right Podcast, get blood on your pages.